Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Matt Shannon and in today's episode, we're gonna be talking about what every photographer must do. So without any further ado, let's just jump right into it. If you're new to this channel, my name is Matt Shannon and I'm a full-time photographer in beautiful British Columbia. From soaring mountains to hidden waterfalls and elusive wildlife to stunning sunsets, I'm excited to film each step of the way. Whether you're here to learn, be inspired, or simply enjoy some stunning visuals, You've come to the right place. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. Okay, so obviously there's going to be some controversy as to what I tell you you should be doing. So let's just have a little bit of fun. And if you hear something that really doesn't sit well with you, make sure to go ahead and write it down in the comments. First thing is back button focus. When you first get your camera, a lot of them have it so that you push this halfway down, it focuses, you push it all the way down and it takes a picture. I hated that. I think it's useful for a few scenarios, but for the most part, I wanna be able to push this down and take the picture and that's it. I don't want it focusing every time. So I actually um, remove that function from there. So all I do is when I push that down, it takes a picture and that's that. The back button here, this little function button where my thumb is, that's what I have as a focus. So I push that, I can focus, I can recompose, and then whenever I'm ready, I can take the picture. I also do this for my vertical, my vertical grip as well. There's a button right here. That is my focus button. That's my trigger. So that's the first thing I would suggest. I switch that and I've never gone back. The next thing is a tripod. I use a tripod all the time. And this is gonna be very useful for some of my other trips, tips, um, but a tripod is an investment. If you can get a good one, please do. It'll, it'll save you in the long run. But if you don't have the money for it, uh, you do what you can. Do your research, take a look. I have some suggestions and I've put them into other videos. I won't go into too much detail about that, but a tripod is gonna be great for stability for your photos so you don't have blurry images, especially when you're doing long exposures during the daytime or at nighttime, but also when you're bracketing your images and, and putting multiple shots together, you want them to be, well, the same shot but maybe your settings are, are different from one image to the next and you wanna fit them all together in post. Well, it's really easy with a tripod and also your hands free. Once your camera's on a tripod, you can actually relax. You're not holding that gear all the time. Tripod's gonna be your friend. Next is using your timer on your camera. So what either you set it to two seconds, five seconds, or even 10 seconds, this will allow any vibrations that are in your camera to actually settle down before taking the photo. This is, I think, quite crucial at night photography when you're trying to take pictures of the stars. You wanna set it to a timer. Instead of just clicking the button, that little movement could be enough to get blurry images. Timer is also great for doing architectural, commercial, uh, real estate photography, where again, you don't wanna create any sort of vibrations or movement. So just putting that on there is awesome. You wanna use that with a tripod if you can. If not, just place it on a rock and you can use timer that way. There's also a delay mode. So instead of having the, the, the beeping sound and a light that illuminates from the front, that kind of indicates like, oh, a picture is about to be taken. You can set it to a delay mode and uh, there you can set it to, um, I think two seconds or even five seconds in a delay mode. Your camera might not have that set up for it, um, but take a look at your manual, at least timer, almost all cameras have that. Next is bracketing. Using bracketing is great for retaining any of the details in the shadows or in the highlights that you might have on a very, very, you know, extremely contrast image uh, setting, say if you're shooting in the middle of the day. How bracketing works is you set up the number of images you want in a sequence, say three or five or seven. And then the second setting is the amount of stops that you want for each image. So say if you wanted one stop between each image in a three shot sequence, your first one will be whatever you think is uh, balanced uh, in its exposure. Your next shot will be one stop brighter overexposed. 
And then your third one will be one stop underexposed. If you wanted to set it up to say two stops in difference, your first one again will be your, your, your first exposed image, whatever you have it set at. And then the next one will be overexposed by two stops and then underexposed by two stops for the third image. And then you can set this up for five images and seven images, like I said, within a sequence. What this is great for is say, if you're doing architectural, commercial real estate photography, or even if you're doing landscapes, you'll want to get the details that are in the shadows that it could be too dark. Also in the highlights where say water um, from a waterfall could be quite bright, whereas the rocks down at the bottom could be too dark and the contrast between the two could be too extreme uh, where bracketing comes in to help balance that all out. So you take those three or five or seven images and in post you go ahead and you put them together into uh, more of a high dynamic image. Next is manual mode with auto ISO. This thing was a, a game changer setting up my camera to take pictures at the correct shutter and aperture that I desired while allowing the ISO to fill in the missing blank. And the reason why this is a game changer is that I don't have to think so much about my exposure by setting my ISO and chasing that exposure level when wildlife is moving through bright skies to dark shadows through like say tree lines down along the lake. That's way too much movement behind the cameras when I'm missing all the action, composing and composition the whole way through. So how to beat that is by still focusing on your shutter and your aperture, but allowing your auto ISO to fill in the rest. And it works seamlessly. And I know some people are like, well, when I rely on auto ISO, it's either way too bright or way too dark. Keep in mind, you are in full control of your camera and its settings. So if things are too bright, well, you can override ISO, auto ISO, by using the exposure compensation. And maybe your settings might be, instead of matrix or evaluative mode, maybe it's on spot metering. And what that means is that the spot is gonna pick up whether it's too bright or too dark of a scene and your auto ISO is gonna move accordingly to make it so it's an evenly exposed spot, right? So if you have spot metering set up and you're on the fur of a black bear, well, obviously your whole scene is gonna be extremely bright uh, when you take that photo in auto ISO. So don't blame auto ISO that your pictures are over um, exposed or underexposed, you still have control of your camera's settings. Auto ISO is a brilliant tool to go ahead and move from scene to scene, still capturing it at the shutter and aperture you want, and then allowing ISO to fill in the rest. Next, marry your lenses and date your camera bodies. Now I have a hard time with this myself because I'm always looking at all the different features that a camera body can do. Uh, but I will say that good glass, good lenses, it's gonna far outlast your camera bodies because the technology is constantly moving between one camera body and the next. Whereas the quality of your glass is really gonna determine how sharp and clear your images are and what you're gonna be happy with. If you have a $7,000 camera body, but you put a kit lens on there, your image is gonna be bottlenecked by your kit lens because you got crap glass on there. Now, I have a hard time looking at camera bodies and thinking, oh man, 20 frames per second. Oh, I, I kind of need that. Oh, it shoots 8K video. <sighs> I need that more than I do lenses. Uh, but some of these lenses I've had for seven or eight years and I invested in good, good glass and still today I can put them on my other camera bodies that are fairly new and I'm really happy that I invested in that. And, and typically their, their value uh, doesn't go down um, too much over the years, whereas camera bodies, they come and go all the time uh, and they're constantly being updated. So 
Investing in glass is, I think, a must. Next is to learn to take photos in the middle of the day. If you're a professional photographer who gets paid uh, to take photos, you're gonna have clients that is that they're only available in the middle of the day or they book you for 1 p.m. because that's when the office is opened. And you gotta go in and take professional photos that is gonna be on their portfolio, their website, maybe something that you wanna share to, to get more clients and more jobs. So you need to know how to photograph in those conditions and turn out a beautiful professional image. So learning how to take photos during the middle of the day, I think is essential. Uh, and if you're traveling to other countries and you're investing in a lot of money, to go somewhere to take that epic shot sometimes you don't get golden hours sometimes uh, the weather comes and uh, it's storming and the only window that you're going to get sunlight blue sky or even be able to go there because roads might be closed that sort of thing is being able to shoot it in the middle of the afternoon during harsh light now earlier I, talk, I talked about bracketing, using a tripod, using timer, all of these things you can, you can use as tools to get the best out of a situation that has harsh lighting. So using those tools, as well as going out and practicing shooting in the middle of the day, I think is gonna get you a whole lot further uh, in your photography career or in the chances of being able to land jobs and have uh, clients that are super satisfied. Now, on the coattails of that, don't think that it's all doom and gloom shooting in the middle of the day. And there is a lot of persuasion that you can have as a professional telling a client, ooh, this is a bad idea. Well, sometimes it just doesn't work out and you have to shoot in the middle of the day. But what you'll find is when you are out photographing in the middle of the day, trying to do your best, you'll surprise yourself with some unique situations where the best images might come out of the middle of the day where the sun is really high and probably the biggest thing is for drone photography when you're shooting in the early mornings or in the evenings the shadows are really long yes they're nice soft light if you're shooting at sort of uh, level with your subject and you got the setting sun uh, that might be beautiful with a drone but if you're gonna do the bird's eye view looking straight down over your subject, say if it's for real estate photography, having those long shadows could be extremely distracting instead of being able to show kind of a bird's eye view of, of the property or especially the water. I find coastal images during the middle of the day is stunning because the light is penetrating down through the water and it gives you these really cool blues, teals, greens. Uh, sometimes there's kelp and stuff that's floating around. And with uh, an angled light, you don't quite get that color and that clarity that you could get in the water that you could get during the middle of the day when you're flying a drone. So using a drone during the middle of the day, I find is a bit of a game changer. For some of you who are shooting for clients and want to get some really beautiful shots, especially along the coastline, that's great. Long shadows can be very, very distracting. So practice shooting during the middle of the day, especially if you're doing drone photography. I think you'll you'll be surprised with your, your outcome. Next is shooting with filters. Now, everything costs money when it comes to photography. So all of this take with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think if you're going to get into it at a more professional level being able to use filters to control the light that's coming into your image sensor to get a better image i think is is the next stepping stone that you might want to take in your photography journey now i just got a whole bunch of really cool uh filters from freewell they sent these out to me and man i'm already really pumped i haven't gotten a chance to use uh, some of these for my lenses here's one that uh, they sent out that snaps right onto the front like it's all magnetic filters for your camera bodies i think are are brilliant i they, they do they do wonders the biggest one is a polarizer being able to take away some reflections whether it's off of water off of uh, windows if you're a photographer of cars that have super sleek 
beautiful smooth edges, you're gonna get a lot of glare, a lot of reflection off of the hood, off of the windshield. Using a polarizer will go ahead and cut a lot of that away. Um, other filters are, are, are darker ND filters that darken your whole image so that you can slow down your shutter speed to get a longer exposure. You can even do this in the middle of the day. I know I said earlier, try shooting in the middle of the day, you'll be surprised. Well, if you put a really, really dark filter uh, on the front of your lens, you can slow down to five minutes even during the middle of the day, clouds that are streaking through the sky uh, during the middle of the day. It looks really cool in black and white. Uh, so yeah, filters, if you can get those, I think every photographer should explore with lens filters. Ask another buddy if he has a filter and, and try it out. Uh, they're great. Next and last is print your work. And I think that's something that a lot of photographers uh, don't do because we have screens now. We have iPads, phones, tablets, uh, and that's how we see images. But being able to actually feel the, feel the image in your hands uh, brings on a whole other meaning to it. And it has a purpose. Like you took the time to edit or process or do any of the work in the field to get that image. Uh, you know, if we see something on Instagram or Facebook, the resolution is quite low and it's a social media thing. You pop it up the next day, people don't see it or it gets buried uh, on other images. But when you print it, that's when it can be truly examined. Share it with other photographers and ask them what their opinion is. And I feel like printing your work is, is part of that that sort of journey of, of understanding what it is that you're doing full circle all the way in the field to having it printed out is now it's printed, it's permanent. It's gonna be up for display. It's not something that's on social media that's gonna get dogpiled on by new posts. Someone might purchase that and it's gonna be in their home for the rest of their lives, right? So that brings a different seriousness as a photographer to what it is that you're making as a choice in the field and bringing it all the way to life through a print. So this is my short list of what I think every photographer must do. And if we lived in a world where everyone did the exact same thing, had the same equipment and set up their camera the same way, it would be a very boring world. So I'm expecting to hear from you down in the comments um, what sort of camera setups and equipment you do that is the same that I do, uh, but what you do that is different. Uh, I learn from other photographers. This is a great community to be a part of, to, to learn from one another. And so I'm excited to hear what you have to say. And uh, hopefully I didn't ruffle too many feathers, uh, but that's why, that's what we do. We create, we share, and we learn from one another. I also want to say that I have two spots available at the time of this recording where you can join me for a multi-day grizzly bear workshop. If you're interested in that, there's a link down below. You can get all the details there and you can also email me if, you're, if you have any questions. Now, if you like this content, please give me that thumbs up. And if you aren't subscribed, maybe think about subscribing. Thank you so much for being here, for listening to what I have to say. And again, I look forward to hearing what you have down in the comments. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye.